Uh, one of the things that I enjoyed a lot was the math club. We had a math honor society and um, occasionally we would be invited to um, tournaments or to meetings and um, I remember that uh, as things were during that era, I remember that we could not stay in the hotels or the motels. We always had families to stay with and uh, I remember traveling to Montgomery and to Anniston and those places and staying with families while we attended meetings and things. So it was actually a very exciting time. We were restricted in a lot of ways, but we really didn't know what we were missing. And when we got here and I saw those huge signs separating white and colored all over the place, uh, I, I, was, I was really outraged and uh, that this was right after the war just a few years after the war for freedom and here we were in this state with these laws on the books separating us everything contrary to our constitution um, all kinds of atrocities were committed against blacks with impunity it was a fascist state and um, it was a miserable time. When I got to the store, the meat counter was in the back of the store. I got to the meat counter, I ordered the ground beef because nobody was there except the butcher. And he got it and he put the meat up on the scale. And just as he did, somebody he hadn't seen in a hundred years came up on the right hand side rolling a bug, a white lady. And he ran around the corner and he started hugging her and they, they're talking. He must have asked about everybody in her family. And she asked, in turn, asked about everybody in his family. Now that sort of distracted me from the purpose and for a while, but after a while I got to think, of grandmother going to think I tear it, and she's not going to be happy. Not to mention she was swift with discipline, okay? I mean, she would retaliate in a, in a heartbeat. Um, so I was beginning to get afraid that she would think I was playing, and, um, but I didn't know I could say anything, so I didn't say anything. Um, I waited, and then he began to wait on her. He um, took my meat and set it to the side. Of, and I'm just standing there, and the meat is on the scale. No, but that seemed as though it would have reminded him I was standing there. But he filled her whole order, and then came around the corner and hugged her and told her that he would see her tonight, that night. And um, when, he, when she walked off, she came toward me. So he turned around and he said one simple word. Um, and he went behind the counter and picked up my meat, wrapped it, and gave it to me. I ran all the way home, yet um, when I got there I was too full as a child to, and I started to cry. When my grandfather brought my grandmother to Birmingham, uh, they lived 50 miles away in Clanton, Alabama, but my grandmother was very sick, and they brought her to Birmingham in the back of the car, back seat of the car, and you know, we became conscious at that point that the hospitals in Birmingham didn't treat black patients. And so there was this dilemma about kind of what to do. And my mother called um, a doctor that she had been using. He was a white doctor, but she had endeared herself to him somewhat. And um, he made arrangements for my grandmother to be accepted at Princeton Hospital. Now, they still didn't place her in a room, they placed her in the basement of Princeton Hospital. And it was literally the basement um, with the pipes, the sweaty pipes, and the only privacy was the little white petitions that they would move around. And uh, so that was sort of one of my first beginning experiences, trying to understand why my grandmother could not receive the same treatments and things in the hospital as the others. And it wasn't something that was talked about at home, you know, where uh, someone said, well, this is the way the hospital operates. I mean, it, there just was no discussion about it, period. Um, the buses were segregated with a color board between the front and the back of the bus, which was very movable. If there were more white people, they just moved the color board back. You know, there may be one little back row for black folks or just behind the back door. Uh, and I was aware of, of that, I mean, that, that became, but it was part of life. I mean, it wasn't something you could change. 
and it didn't bother me particularly. It was just the way it was, you know. Um, until one day, a, a young mother, I presume it was a mother, uh, boarded the bus with a child. Um, I don't remember now, it was a little boy or a little girl. I just remember this little child who jumped up in the front seat and to look out the window, which children, of course, always want to do. Um, and she paid the bus driver and got her change. And then she grabbed this child by the hand and sort of slid him off the seat and down the aisle. And, oh, you know, and the, the, the little one was saying, but I want to sit here. And she was saying, no, you've got to come with me. And she bent over and spoke to him and went on back to the back of the bus. And that just this really grabbed my heart. I was, I was almost in tears because I thought, what if that were my child, what would I tell that child? Would I teach that child that those bad white folks did this to you? Or would I teach my child you're not good enough to sit in the front because your skin is brown? Uh, what would I say? And I could not come up with an acceptable answer as a Christian person. I couldn't. And I don't think I could have had I not been a Christian person. Um, but that was my first awareness of how, how, how terrible this was, how humiliating. Uh, what, a, what, a, what an awful put down, and, and, and how would you deal with this issue in your family? And I couldn't solve that problem. I was in the eighth grade and about to attend Parker High School, but um, one of our local black people, in fact, I think it was probably our only black millionaire during that time, Dr. A.G. Gaston, uh, one of the things that he did each year was sponsor the citywide countywide and statewide spelling contest. And uh, I was sort of dragged kicking and screaming into this <laughs> spelling contest, but um, according to the records that they, the um, scholastic aptitude tests, I think they took back then, according to those tests, I had a real aptitude for spelling. So I was forced into this, this spelling bee. And uh, I did have the privilege of winning the city, the county, and the statewide contest. And Dr. Gaston was willing to sponsor me to the national contest, but you had to also be sponsored by your local newspaper. And I was not permitted to be a national contestant because blacks were not permitted to be part of the spelling, the national spelling competition. So that was sort of the second um, thing that had me really think about uh, Birmingham and just try to understand the world around me, the society around me. I uh, got in, in to the movement to fight for my own freedom. Not, I, I, I certainly didn't feel comfortable uh, living under these conditions at all. I didn't feel like a free person or American citizen. Because I did all of this volunteer work at the church, I happened to be there when these meetings started, when the mass meetings started. And uh, I can tell you my first, my first encounter with that, I was working in the back in the church office. I was that day opening mail, answering phones and things. And I heard this wonderful singing going on. And it's, it was something that sort of moved my spirit, but I wasn't sure exactly what was going on. So when I went to the door and I peeped into the sanctuary, our church was filled with people and mostly young people. So when I saw all of these young people, I thought, you know, I'm not sure what's going on, but I want to be part of this. So I went out and I took a seat in the audience and just sat there to listen to what was going on. There were speeches from, uh, usually Reverend Abernathy would speak before Dr. King, uh, James Bevel, uh, Jesse Jackson again, Andrew Young. Each one would say uh, their part of what piece of this program they thought was important. James Bevel primarily concentrated on speaking to young people about the rules of engagement, the rules of marching. And we were constantly reminded that this was a nonviolent movement. They came out and talked about, um, here's what you can expect. You know, policemen may do this, they may hit, they may kick, they may spit, 
they bring dogs. Here are all the things you can expect if you're going to march with these students. And um, if you don't think, you know, this is kind of your time to bow out if this is not uh, your cup of tea, if you don't have the stomach for this, if you can't be nonviolent, this is the time to bow out. So um, after students heard the speeches, after they heard the instructions, it was usually followed by more singing in a prayer and then uh, we would leave the building. This particular day when we left the building, they said someone will come to where you are tomorrow or will let you know when it's time to march. At Parker High School, it just happened, uh, I had the early lunch, the 11 o'clock lunch, and while we were standing around outside talking, someone came to the fence, and they had this big sign, and the sign said, it's time. And when we saw the it's time, we knew what that meant. So some of us climbed fences, and some of us squeezed through fences, and some actually walked out of the front door. Uh, teachers turned their heads the other way, and uh, to my knowledge, most students were not uh, punished or reprimanded for leaving, but um, many, many students walked out of school that day. I remember the first mass meeting we went to uh, when we were downtown, and somebody told grandmother about King, and uh, they just kept saying the name King. And there used to be a show came on TV called Sergeant Preston of the Yukon. Um, and he had this wonderful dog that saved the day every time, named King. And I must say, we lived in the projects again, <laughs> so we didn't have pets. Our dream was on a dog. Everybody wanted a dog like King. But anyway, we, uh, grandmother, when we came home, grandmother told everybody, get ready. We're going to uh, Tabernacle Baptist Church to see King. So we went around and told other kids in the projects that King was going to be at TAP. A lot of people were there, and it was a lot of children, and we were looking for King. And when they introduced the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., we were still looking for a king. We were asking where we king, and, and, and the, uh, you know, adults was making us be quiet. But when Dr. King started to speak, it just, everybody started getting quiet, all of us children. That man's voice was just so mesmerizing. A lot of us did not understand exactly what he was talking about or the value of it. But I know for me, from that day forward, I wanted to do what this man said do because it was something that was going to be very important and something that was going to mean a lot and something that I thought would just make him smile because he was just, oh, he was just, mesmerizing. He always had time for us, mm -hmm. and he had the softest hands I've ever felt. Mm -hmm. He always had um, time to say a word or to pet. Like, um, grown-ups couldn't get in, into a lot of meetings that they wanted to get in with him, but children could come in, and even though the grown-ups would try to brush us out, that they were busy doing this, Dr. King would, um, say, uh, would take his to take time to say hello and to touch us, and then we'd be all right, we're gone, you know. Then we got to get, we got to go close to Dr. King. The black community decided we would have, they would not buy Easter clothes downtown because they could not sit down and have a cup of coffee or have a Coke or lunch or anything in the store. They couldn't even drink out of a decent, you know, they had to go around the corner to find a water fountain that had colored written over it. Uh, sometimes there wasn't a restroom for them, and they decided the way to, to deal with that, to, to let people know this was not acceptable, uh, would be to not buy anything in the downtown area. Uh, I think they had learned something. This had come after the Montgomery boycott had happened, uh, and Rosa Parks had decided she was tired of standing up. <laughs> she was going to sit down, bless her heart. Uh, bless her heart. She's really one of my heroines, I think because she had the courage of her conviction. She had the courage to do what was right, you know. Um, but in, anyway, um, 
I stood up in that meeting when they announced that, and I said, I think that's a wonderful thing to do. I think that's an important thing to do. Because if I couldn't have a Coke when I was tired and shopping, if I couldn't stop for lunch, I don't think I would be in the store shopping either. And I'll just say as a white person, I'm not going to shop downtown this, this, this year either. Um, I made the front page of one of the, <laughs> one of the Klan newspapers as being a leader in this boycott, which I thought was kind of nice uh, to get credit for something as, as impressive as that. They were involved with the um, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. And SNCC used to be over at my um, present church, War Chapel. They had, uh, they would do uh, sit-ins at the lunch counters and at the bus stations, and I was the gopher. I would go and get their mothers when they were arrested <laughs> and stuff like that. So uh, I started learning things, um, different little things then. But we had buses here at Selma, and I know there's a lot of um, history with that Montgomery boycott, but we had a bus company here in Selma too that a lot of people may be forgotten about. And grandmothers used to ride the bus. Uh, but the women decided they weren't riding that bus no more. <laughs> they, were, they put a bus cop, uh, a boycott on that they never recovered from. We haven't seen a bus, bus since. Mr. Yes. Montgomery <laughs> bus came back. We haven't seen a bus here in Selma since. True, Those true. women did it. By 1965, we had been marching, marching, marching. And um, it was just a normal thing to do. Nobody stayed at home. Nobody went to school. Mm -hmm. Started like January '65. Oh. Nobody started. Um, nobody was going to school um, because we had we were at war essentially, and uh, we didn't use those phrases mm -hmm. then. I don't recall, but we was essentially at war, for, fighting for the things that we talked about, fighting for the things that we knew were right. We, we were raised as Christians, and, and we still are. And uh, if you teach uh, that doctrine, and you learn that doctrine, and you know you're supposed to do that, that's what you're supposed to do. There's no if, ands, and buts that's about bad. it. So essentially, you had to be just like the ultimate activist, and the ultimate activist to me was Jesus. Once you felt that pain, that, and there's some hope that this pain can go away, not just for um, yourself individually, but for everybody, because you don't want anybody to feel like you felt when you were experiencing this. So what you do is you, you get up and do something. Uh, the church that I attended was 16th Street Baptist Church, and it was a wonderful place to be because uh, young people had many roles within the church. Uh, I mentioned earlier my role as secretary of the Sunday school, but I also made many trips on behalf of the church. I traveled to uh, youth conferences and to national Baptist conventions and things, and I learned a lot. I met people, and it was just really a very engaging and fruitful period at the church. September 15th um, was just a normal Sunday for me. I left home about uh, 9.25. Because I was secretary, my habit was that I would put those two younger brothers in class, then I would collect all of my materials for um, making the secretarial report, attendance and finance. And once I collected those and passed them out, I would sit in my own Sunday school class. Now, at our church, the children were in the rooms downstairs, and the adults were in the children in the uh, rooms upstairs. So what I normally did was go upstairs, collect all of the reports in the office, pass them out upstairs, go downstairs, pass them out, and go to class. And that's what I did that Sunday. Then about 10, usually about 10, 15, 10, 20, I would go back and start collecting everything downstairs and go upstairs. So this Sunday, uh, was pretty much the same, uh, with the exception that uh, as I started up the stairs, I did pass the bathroom uh, where the girls were and uh, paused at the door to speak to all of them and uh, didn't know there were actually five girls in the bathroom. We never talk about the fifth girl, Sarah. But um, when I 
passed the bathroom, I spoke and just paused for a minute and uh, then went up two more flights of stairs. When I cleared the second flight of stairs, the phone was ringing in the church office and I answered the church phone and mail caller on the other end said three minutes. And I can, I can be precise about this just because we have a lot of people that call and they come by, they want to count the steps and they want to time it and everything. So from the phone call, um, there was 15 steps from the phone call to where I was when the bomb exploded. Uh, we know there was about um, anywhere from a one and a half minute to two minute window from my leaving the girls to where I was when the bomb exploded. Um, but I was upstairs, uh, had just stepped out into the sanctuary. And I didn't know it was a bomb at the time. I really wasn't sure what it was, what was going on. I just remember thinking weather, something weather, maybe rain or thunder. And as quickly as I thought that, all of the windows just came crashing in. When the bomb exploded, I just remember hearing someone say, hit the floor. And it was very quiet in the church. And it seems like um, a long time, but it was probably about 15 seconds. And uh, then I heard feet. I could tell that people were getting up and running out of the church. And uh, after I heard feet, I got up and we all went out through, I'll say the back, but it's actually the entrance to the church. I can tell you that it took about um, somewhere between eight and nine months for the church to be repaired. And uh, when the church was reopened, we had a lot of members that didn't come back. They were afraid to come back and they were afraid that the church would be bombed again. And in fact, bombings did continue all over Birmingham. Even after the girls were killed, bombings continued all over Birmingham. So we lost a lot of people for that reason. And it was uh, April of 64 when they bombed our neighborhood. We were asleep. This bomb exploded about three o'clock in the morning and it was the most horrible sound. This is where I really heard the sound of, of all of this force. When we were in the church, I guess because we were inside and because the church is so thick and well built, we didn't really get this impact. We didn't hear this noise. But in that house at three in the morning, everything lit up. It lit up like it was daylight for about three seconds it seemed, it just, it's just daylight. And my two brothers, I again had four brothers, the two on the top, they were sleeping on two sets of bunk beds. The two on the top were thrown to the floor. That's how horrific the impact was. And after the, they were thrown to the floor, it was dark again. And then we heard these horrible screams out in the street. It was, one of the most horrible nights that I've ever lived through. And uh, it was so frightening. So I said I was afraid for a long time. I was really afraid after that. That's when the rashes really got bad on my hands and things. When Jimmy Lee Jackson was murdered by a state trooper in Marion, Alabama, that was for me the very last straw. And it was at our next meeting that Hosea Williams was a speaker. And he was describing what was going on in Selma, how terribly the people, we, well, we had seen Sheriff Jim Clark, you know, just knock C.T. Vivian off the Dallas courthouse steps. And at the end of his talk, he just looked straight at this group of folks and he said, you know, I see all of these white faces sitting here. You meet every month and you talk and you talk and you write letters to the people and you write letters to the congressman and you write letters to the city people and, and you write letters to the police chief and all of that. But, said, but you never put your body where your mouth is. So when he finished speaking and uh, during the Q&A, at this point, I knew that there were, that they, many people in the council were ready to do something. And so I said, I asked, how would it be if some white people went to Selma? 
and he became quite excited about that. Well, you know, that was like somebody dashing cold water on what you thought you were just in there, just being your best person and doing the best you could. And, and here he was saying, why don't you just stand up and be counted? But anyway, we, we had to come up with another name. We couldn't use the council name because we had, didn't have the approval of everybody in the council. So um, it was decided that we would be the concerned white citizens of Alabama. Um, but anyway, we struggled with what can we do and how can we go and, and peacefully stand up and be counted as Alabama white citizens who believe that everyone has the right to vote. So we decided to go on March the 6th, 1965. We were not allowed a parade permit in Selma. Uh, some of us talked to the officials in Selma could not get a parade permit because they had. A, they said they had too much on their plate, they had the things going on the next day, and that they could not guarantee us any kind of protection if we had a parade. That if we insisted on coming to Selma, that we could come and we would walk in groups not to exceed four persons in a group. Joe was stopped by this man and Bishop and presented with a telegram from the head of the Missouri Synod of that region saying that Joe was not speaking for the Lutheran Church. And that while, just as that was being read to him, there was an old broken down automobile in the, inter, in the intersection with its, or, or intersection with its uh, hood up. And a group of people gathered around it as if they were trying to repair their automobile. But this was a group of the people who were against our march and they set off this stink bomb, this bright red smoke bomb thing, and the smoke blew the other way. It blew toward them across their group, and it was really difficult not to chuckle because you could see this going on, and with the seriousness going on in front of you, the, 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 whole, the incongruity of the whole thing just sort of you know, spills in on you as you sit there and look at it. It wasn't funny. It was very serious, and extremely, we were extremely grateful that the smoke had carried it the other way and felt like, you know, maybe God is speaking to us in the midst of this strange thing for me and certainly for my husband to be doing at that point in time. And then we went on across the street. Joe read our statement of purpose and there was so much noise, I couldn't hear a word he said. We, as white citizens of Alabama, have come to Selma today to tell the nation that there are white people in Alabama who will speak out against the events which have recently occurred in this and neighboring counties and towns. Therefore, as citizens of the United States of America and of this state of Alabama, we do by our presence here affirm our faith in the abiding principles upon which our nation and our state is founded and for which our forefathers died. We are immovable in our determination that this be a nation under God with liberty and justice for all. Uh, this was read um, with lots of catcalls, very ugly things being said, like, you know, let's just dump them in the river, and why are these commies here, and all of the other expletives that came out of the mouths of the people who were truly against us. And I think filled with fear. Their hatred came out of their fear. I, I've, I've, I felt at that moment a little sorry for them, particularly when we sang America the Beautiful, and they didn't even recognize this wonderful, wonderful song. So, but when he finished, then I heard this huge roar, you know, and I thought, oh boy, they're really here en masse, and this is going to be the end. <laughs> and turned around to see there was the uh, building across the street, a federal building, was just filled with black people. And they started singing, We Shall Overcome. And so <laughs> we left that space, you know, with that wonderful singing in our ears and just, you know, just floated back to the church. And again, they were driving slowly along beside us all the way. Of course, the next day was March the 7th, 1965, Bloody Sunday. And uh, that was... Oh, that was so terrible. And felt because, you know, because of what happened the next day, 
that this had no value. We had wasted our time. But I came to realize that it was not wasted time because it had required us 72 white people to truly examine ourselves and what we really cared about. And some people had, had responded to our witness, so it had meant something to somebody, a small amount, but it had meant something to us in our growth as Christian human beings, um, that we were doing what we could do, even though it was inconsequential and did not stop what happened. We normally would, um, when we march and we'd be stopped um, and not arrested, we would uh, kneel and pray and return back to where we, you know, our point of origin. But this particular Sunday, it was like um, we knelt and prayed. We heard them say we could, we were in legal assembly and could not go further. Um, so we were automatically were down on our, went down on our knees. Then we heard the, these pops, and it turned out to be the tear gas, and 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 people started running and and was very disoriented. I remember being, I was on my knees, and somebody grabbed me in the back of my neck and, and on my lapel in the front, and they were pulling me backwards from a kneeling position. Um, I bit the hand that was on my lapel, and I heard um, the word nigger very strongly, um, and I got hit over my eye. In fact, I got hit twice there at that time. I remember a point where I was getting up, I was running into the tear gas, and somebody was running behind me, hitting me. When I woke up, I was uh, being carried to a, a hearse. And um, I was on a stretcher, and they used hearse at that time for black funeral homes because really didn't have ambulance service. Um, and people were running back across the bridge, and I let them know I wasn't dead, and I just got up and started running. When we got across the bridge, I was near the middle or closer to the back of the line. Um, so a lot of people still behind me, but a uh, whole lot in front. And I couldn't really see or hear anything um, that was happening down front. When we got to the highest point of the bridge and you could see over the other side, I saw the policeman, so I knew we were not going to Montgomery. It was um, just another march for me. Um, when the line stopped, as another said, normal procedure would have been for us to kneel and have prayer and then go back to the church, regroup, or whatever we were going to do, right? I heard, I thought they were gunshots. I had never heard a gunshot. I thought they were gunshots and um, screams. We thought they were killing the people down front. But before we could turn and react to this, the front had turned. And the people in front of us were running back and um, trying to get back. And um, we were knocking each other down, trying to get out of the way. And with them came those policemen. And they were hitting anybody, old, young, black, white, male, female, they were just beating people. And what I remember the most are the screams, people screaming, and I probably was screaming too, screaming and screaming. And how when um, the tear gas got to us, um, it burst your eyes and it was in our lungs, you couldn't breathe, can't see. Um, and then people are around you um, beating people and people are laying on the ground like, they were dead. We, it was awful. I never been so terrified in my life. Blood was everywhere on that bridge. Then the men on horses, and the men with the gas mask on. I had never seen a gas mask up close. So I didn't know what it was. That's something from now to limits. Right. These <laughs> monsters coming at us, and the the I can't even describe the pandemonium and the, and the fear. Um, that was present on that bridge, but the screams and screams were just awful. I, I don't remember anything else until I awakened in that car, and Linda was crying, just crying. And but when I looked up, she was covered with blood, whole face and all this. It scared me so bad. It scared me even worse because she was going to take care of me. But um, and her.
her snatching me and us running because I, I, I started screaming. And we were running, running, running. As she said, we were like 10 feet from our door, but we, <laughs> we were too scared to go. To, to stop. You didn't even see it. I didn't even I didn't think about even it because see it. if we passed Brown Chapel to get to First Baptist, we had to get past our house. Because a lot of people think they beat us up on the bridge and then that was it. We went back to the church and we nursed our wounds and we prayed. That is not so. Mm -hmm. That is not so. What happened on that bridge happened all night long down in GWC. Mm -hmm. Those men had gone crazy, okay? They shot out windows in the house. They were beating people all night. We didn't see. I didn't see my daddy until the next day, cause he too couldn't come home. You know, um, we were in the church, and they came into the church. They threw this young man through the walls of the baptismal pool, and in First Baptist, in the church, no place was sacred. Mm -hmm. We were like, I just couldn't believe this was happening. It was awful, truly, truly awful. But, and after that, um, oh yeah, I, I really don't want to say this okay, but after that, I ain't want no more freedom. Whatever that was, I ain't want no more freedom. I don't care what grandma say. I ain't want no more freedom. It wasn't worth it. I, I didn't want to play no more. It was no longer fun. And it was no longer that I felt that I needed to be there. I really wanted to be a little girl in my love zone. Uh, Daddy agreed to let me uh, go walk from Selma to Montgomery. And um, he had some women in the movement that agreed to uh, um, be my chaperone on that walk because I was 14 years old. We left um, on that Sunday, March 21st. I'll never forget it. And Daddy had agreed that I could go. Um, the next morning, um, when we woke up, it had been raining. It was drizzling rain. And uh, the president had federalized the Alabama National Guard to uh, take care of us or protect us. That morning, I came out of the tent. It was real foggy and, and, and drizzling and rainy. And across the uh, road were all of these uh, National Guardsmen, and a lot of jeeps and trucks and stuff. But I focused on three guardsmen that were standing by a jeep. They had on their rain gear and helmets, and they had their rifles, the butt end at their waist, and they had their bayonets affixed to the end of that rifle. And they were just standing there holding those rifles. And it looked like they were looking directly, directly at me. And I knew then that those people were there to kill me. This was my 15th birthday, March 22nd. I was terrified. I wanted to get back home to my daddy at 138 CGWC home. I didn't want no freedom. I didn't care if you ever voted. I was scared that they were there to kill me. I knew that. All the people that had beat at me two weeks before, and I, I didn't, I said beat it because they beat and beat and beat it, you know, until I, I, they just, ooh, all those people, they were white. I didn't see any black National Guardsmen. So some of those National Guardsmen had to be some of those people that had beat me. And now, those three had to be three of the ones because they were there to kill me, you know. They stopped that morning. The march got what started an hour later because Miss Lily Brown, Mrs. Marie Foster, Mrs. Amelia Boynton, um, Right, Doctor, I was going to say Doctor, but it's Reverend Willie Bowles. Those three women thought it was very important not to let me go back as terrified as I was. And I, I still have never been that terrified since, I can remember since. 
and they talked to me. Now, they told me a lot of things, and I can't remember anything they said. I remember one person. This was a, uh, um, and was the guy, J Jim Letterer. Jim was the uh, white guy you might have seen pictures of in um, during the march from Selma to Montgomery that had a one leg and he often carried the flag or had on a American flag somewhere on it. He said, before he let anything happen to me, before I let them harm another hair on your head, I will lay down and die for you. And I remember that. And somehow, and I still don't know how, but I got the courage to go on from Selma to Montgomery. What I remember most about the women uh, that I knew that worked, um, most of them were very strong supporters. They were encouragers. They played uh, outstanding uh, supportive roles, which would later really become important because they became the source of documentation for so much of what we do. We had women who were even taking many of the pictures then. The men were uh, giving the speeches and being out front, but the women were offering uh, the support uh, to everything that was being done. I recall um, when they, the, the powers that be wouldn't let people buy uh, food for the movement. Mm -hmm. And uh, women who worked in cafeterias, uh, particularly mm -hmm. like at Selma University, would order enough food, not only for the students, but for the movement too. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't sell them gas. And um, Mr. Philip Green did his share there. He would have made sure they had gas. You know, yeah, everybody stage. did something. And these women fill these roles, and they'll say, well, I didn't march. Their role was more, much more critical than physically marching. Because without that, that support, mm -hmm. couldn't have marched, couldn't have done anything, period. We had women from Mountain Brook. We had women from Vestavia and Homewood. We had women from Birmingham. Many of the women talked about how they had loaned their cars without their husbands knowing that they had loaned their cars. Uh, many of them had made financial contributions. Uh, there were many women that talked about uh, the March on Washington, how they prepared sandwiches and box meals that could be taken on the buses and that could be taken to meetings that were lasting on into the night. So there we were finding out, we knew about some of these roles that women were playing, but as they came forward, we came to see that as they always have been, women were very present and very much a part of what was going on. And I would even venture to say that a lot of this would not have happened in the way that it did, in the successful way that it did, had these women not been there. I think though our children have a, a better future because of, um, because of that movement. Because of that movement. And I think not only um, do they have a better better opportunity that the the world owes owes Selma for those opportunities too. That uh, what we did here just didn't benefit um, Selma. Blacks it, and Selma. It benefited this whole nation. And there's also this misconception that it was an uh, African-American movement, and it was not. Mm -hmm. It was a people movement. It was fought by people mm -hmm. of all colors and sizes and races, um, and it, was, it benefited all people. Um, and, and it was a real crisis time in terms of the lives of, of Christian people, of all people, but people who were struggling with their Christianity and struggling with their fears. Um, Golly, you know, it's, it's a miracle that we've moved an inch. And I think we've moved a few miles.